FDA has sensible rules about when it should convene an advisory committee. In its policy guidance, it lists three criteria. And the document says if any one of the three criteria are met, an advisory committee should be convened. The criteria are if a decision is potentially controversial, an advisory committee should be convened with good reason. It's, the way, it's a way that FDA can show the public that they consulted experts when making a controversial decision. Or if it's simply an issue of significant public interest, FDA should hold an advisory committee meeting. And lastly, if the decision would benefit from consulting experts, for example, experts in addiction or experts in neurobiology who would understand that exposing an 11-year-old long-term to a highly addictive <laughs> drug would have a much greater risk of, a, of addiction. All of those criteria were met for the OxyContin for Children decision. Only one of them needed to be met. All three were met, and yet FDA bypassed its advisory committee. This is something FDA has been doing repeatedly. They did it recently with Hysingla, an extended release hydrocodone product, and they did it with Targanique, another opioid made by Purdue Pharma. FDA has been doing this ever since the Zohydro decision. As you heard from Senator Manchin and, and Senator Markey, FDA approved Zohydro over the objection of an advisory committee, which voted 11 to 2 to keep the drug off the market. And because they approved the drug over the objection of an advisory committee, there was a backlash. Members of Congress spoke out, attorney generals, governors, consumer advocacy organizations. And in their letters to HHS and to FDA, every letter started the same way. It said, how could FDA have approved the drug over the objection of its advisory committee? What we have seen FDA do since Ohydro is bypass the advisory committee repeatedly for opioid decisions. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is the law that gives FDA the authority to regulate pharmaceutical companies. That law says that drug companies are prohibited from promoting their products for conditions where the risks of use might outweigh the benefits. If FDA had been properly enforcing that law when OxyContin was introduced, in 1996, I don't believe we would have an epidemic today. If the law had been enforced, Purdue would have been told, you can market OxyContin in hospices, to the palliative care doctors, to the oncologists, but you can't send your sales force to the family doctors, to the general practitioners. If that law had been enforced, we wouldn't have an epidemic today. But even by the early 2000s, when it was clear that the prescribing was taking off at a rate beyond anything that could be clinically needed, at that point FDA could have begun to enforce the law. And the epidemic never would have gotten as bad as it did. And instead, they went the opposite direction. They eased the rules so that other drug companies could get their extended release opioids onto the market. I commend Senator Markey and Senator Manchin for raising this issue. I commend them for insisting that the FDA put the interests of public health ahead of pharmaceutical companies. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Now we're going to hear from the experts in Massachusetts and West Virginia. Uh, we're going to begin with Chief Leonard Campanello from Gloucester, Massachusetts. He's the police chief, and he has begun one of the most innovative programs in our country that changed the way we look at this crisis. Please come over, Chief. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senators. Um, I believe uh, the reason myself and my colleague from West Virginia are here to give you a snail's eye view of what's going on in the country, meaning uh, we are on the front lines. We're in law enforcement. We're seeing what's happening, how opioids are ravaging the country, uh, how our young people in all walks of life are being killed by this disease, uh, are dying from this disease, and how we are realizing that this war on drugs that we've had for the last 50 or 60 years is gone, uh, and we're changing the way we do things in law enforcement to, to assist people who are suffering from this disease as opposed to uh, incarcerate or further exacerbate their already uh, bad issues. Uh, the reason we're doing this is because it makes sense, uh, but we can't do it alone. 
we're doing it at a grassroots level right now. The program started in Gloucester, which, which facilitates treatment for people with addiction as opposed to incarceration, uh, has spread uh, across Massachusetts and indeed across the nation in about 75 different uh, police departments uh, in 19 states. Uh, the reason that's catching on is because it works. It puts people into treatment, it reduces recidivism, it reduces the crime rate as we're seeing, and um, it's the right thing to do from a humanitarian perspective. But we need help. We cannot do this piecemeal from, uh, from West Virginia to Massachusetts to Ohio to New York, wherever we've been, and talked about this. We need help at a federal level. We need the police department of the drug companies, the FDA, to step up and take their role as law enforcers of pharmaceuticals. We know that 80 percent, as the Senator mentioned, 80 percent of our heroin use in our community stems from legitimately prescribed medication that was prescribed from a legal source, a legal source. And we can't continue that trend. Um, again, we can't continue this piecemeal around the country. We have to wait. We have to have the FDA step in with good leadership and hold pharmaceuticals accountable for uh, what they're putting on the streets. And right now, we don't see that as being done. Uh, and in law enforcement, we see every day the tragic effects of uh, not holding the right entities responsible and accountable and allowing uh, these dangerous and deadly poisons to proliferate across the United States and indeed into every area that we see. Uh, so I think that, um, that my colleague from West Virginia will probably echo the statements. John Rosenthal, who will be speaking after me, will be able to uh, speak a little bit to the national movement by police departments to uh, address this issue from a ground roots level. And uh, we certainly stand with the senators uh, in um, requiring, if law enforcement is able to change the way they think about addiction, requiring the FDA to do the same and to hold those uh, accountable who need to be held accountable at a federal level. Thank you. Let me say it's my pleasure to introduce a friend of mine I've known for a long time. He's dedicated his life to law enforcement. Uh, he is a former uh, sheriff of Boone County. The Southern Coalfields of West Virginia has been hit extremely hard. Uh, he's now executive director of the Sheriff's Association of the State of West Virginia, Rodney Miller. Good afternoon, and, and thank you, Senators, for having us up here. Um, in the law enforcement community, what normally takes place when a situation gets bad, when it gets bad on the street, Cops call for backup. In this situation, our distinguished senators have called for backup, and we're very, very proud to stand with you on this very important topic. Now, as law enforcement officers, we are now calling for backup from the FDA. We have to have, at the highest level, the policing to combat the opioid, opioid drug abuse in the United States. It's kind of a jargon term that we've, we've termed in southern West Virginia, but it's almost the numbing of America with what's taking place with the, uh, with the uh, prescriptions of, of opioids. We have a population that have literally broken their backs for the energy of the United States and the mining industry that when they need help from physicians, they get it in the form of opiates, reportedly for a short-term uh, solution, which comes into a long-term solution. Um, that ends up being a gateway drug into the heroin, ep heroin epidemic that we're seeing across the United States. Uh, and, and we don't use the, the word epidemic lightly. Um, drug overdoses have become the leading cause of injury and death, surpassing motor vehicle related deaths, not just in West Virginia, but across the country. In 2011, drug misuse and abuse caused about 2.5 million emergency room visits to local hospitals. Of these, more than 1.4 million of those were related to pharmaceuticals. Everyone in our community, or especially our law enforcement officers, who are on the front lines of this epi epidemic, every day are trying to be aggressive as possible in eliminating the epidemic. In West Virginia, for example, we're one of the first states that jumped on board with a uh, needle syringe um, exchange program. We've got to do something. And from a personal standpoint, I was probably one of the worst in 30 plus years of law enforcement to say that we have to arrest and incarcerate everyone that we can potentially uh, get our hands on when it comes to the drug problem. After 30 years plus looking at the problem, that, that's simply not working. We, we've got to re reach and, and come with more innovative ideas, um, but that alone won't work. We have to have help from the top. 
Just because an individual calls 911 does not mean that they have to be uh, in, in fear for being incarcerated or arrested. Uh, I think the Chief's program, and, and we found out more about that earlier, is, is great. If an individual comes in and turns themselves in, brings their drugs, they want help, they actively want help, that's what we in law enforcement are supposed to do. We're supposed to help people. It's not all about what you see on television, locking the people up in, in, the, in the visits to the courtroom. We're truly public service servants that are out to try to help our society. From a personal standpoint, I've seen what it impacts, what impacts it has had to the families, especially in southern West Virginia and Boone County where I'm from. They are asking for help. They are ask, asking for help from the highest level. It's important enough that they're asking for help that I make the seven hour drive up here to stand by our senators to let you know, let the FDA know, this is not a joke. This is serious. We are now asking for their, their backup along the ways. Recently, a West Virginia television station put out a report on the national average of babies being born as drug dependent. Babies born drug dependent, a national average is, is about five per 1,000. In West Virginia, it's five times that amount, approximately 37 out of 1,000 are uh, born drug uh, dependent. The average cost for delivering a baby is around 18,000, or I'm sorry, $13,000 for a non-addicted baby. If you turn that around for a drug-dependent baby, that translates to about $84,000. We simply can't afford to continue going the way, way we are going, socially, economically, and emotionally. It's an emotional um, topic in West Virginia. There are people that want help. They don't know where to turn. They have to have facilities. They have to have resources to go to. We hear from physicians. We don't know what to do. We, we prescribe for what we, what we have given information for. We're hearing that they're asking for help. We're hearing that treatment centers are needed. We're hearing from pharmacists. We can't not fill these prescriptions because the doctors write them. We have to fulfill their orders. So there, there's much more that, that we could go on and we could stand here for, for all day and go on with this. But we in the law enforcement community certainly would like to thank Senator Manchin and Senator Markey for fighting the change in the FDA that's going to help stop these addictive drugs because we have to do something. And we're calling for backup because it is that serious a problem on our streets. Thank you. Um, so as you've been hearing, this is largely a pharmaceutical company and physician created crisis in our country. And the law enforcement community, the treatment community, is asking for help. The experts are those who are in law enforcement. The experts are those who are in the treatment community. And just to keep this in the back of your mind, just pick a number how much <coughs> opioid pain-killing prescription drugs were authorized by the DEA last year. Just pick a number in your mind with regard to how many pills could be made out of that, what they approved last year. Pick a number, how many pills for America? Here's the answer, 12 billion pills for our country last year. It's just staggering. And what we do is we see the consequences on the streets of our country. We have here a man, John Rosenthal, who is co-founder of the Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Initiative. He's been working very closely with Chief uh, Campanello to perfect it in Massachusetts and then uh, spread it across the country because it is a very smart way of dealing with this issue. John, please come over. Thank you so much, Senators, for taking the leadership on this public health epidemic. I mean, we're a people, we're a country of people and laws uh, and sadly, when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, we have an FDA that is truly more of a lapdog than a watchdog. And it's resulting in over 40,000 deaths a year. You know, when I was asked to come speak last week, uh, little did I know uh, that I'd be leaving Washington and going to my nephew's funeral from an opioid overdose. 
look, folks, you know, there's only two solutions here. You can talk about root causes. You can talk about, you know, the, the, the nominee. And I've been a huge supporter of the president, but it's, it's shameful and it's irresponsible to have an FDA director who virtually is more concerned about the pharmaceutical industry than public health and safety. There are two options, folks. It's treatment or death. And I bet if I asked for a show of hands in this room of what family hasn't been impacted by the opioid addiction epidemic, we wouldn't see any hands. So, what we've attempted to do is fill the void uh, that, frankly, the FDA has left behind. And so with law enforcement as the lead, and people aren't used to saying no to police chiefs, we created this, this innovative program in Gloucester, Mass. It simply said to the folks suffering with the disease of addiction that this is a chronic disease, no different than diabetes, no different from cancer. It needs to be treated the same way. We need to get rid of the barriers that consider people who are addicted junkies and get people into treatment, not jail. And so when the police chief announces that beginning June 1st, anyone with the disease of addiction can come into the Gloucester Police Department with or without their drugs and get into treatment, not jail, we had over 400 people come into the Gloucester Police Department in the last eight months and another 400 among the 65 police departments across the country that have partnered from Maine, the very state where the governor is saying he may call out the National Guard to arrest addicts. We have police chiefs in Scarborough and Augusta and Paris actually helping them into treatment. And there's another 100 police departments across the country who are embracing this and over 200 treatment centers. Don't ever accept that there are no tra treatment beds. There are treatment beds. Sadly, there are treatment beds when a police chief calls. Okay, well, then that's the reality. But we need treatment beds, and we need a continuum of care for this disease, like any other disease, across this country. And Congress needs to make that happen. And the last thing we need is an FDA director who literally is a lapdog for the pharmaceutical industry versus a, a watchdog for the American people. So we have a great solution in Gloucester, and it's taking off across the country. We're changing the conversation. We're changing uh, the continuum of care for this disease. But we can't rely on law enforcement to do it. We need Congress to act and act quickly to deal with this epidemic. And I cannot thank our senators, Markey and Manchin, enough for being courageous, taking a leadership role, and doing whatever is necessary to hold up this appointment, to get the President and the, and the majority of Congress to understand that we need to address this disease of epi the epidemic of, of addiction. And it is not appropriate for a member of the pharmaceutical industry, a, a benefactor of the pharmaceutical industry, to be a watchdog for that very industry. Thank you. I couldn't put it any better than John just put it because we're asking the president to get involved, to step up. I believe the president truly understands it. He understands what an epidemic we have. And to illustrate that I believe that the president gets it, he came to the state of West Virginia, one of the hardest states hit, and one of his least supportive states. That's where his ratings are probably the poorest in the nation. So for him to come to West Virginia and take this head on says that he gets it. I believe that this nomination is staff driven not presidential driven. And I believe that the president should step in and say, wait a minute, maybe we better rethink this. That's what we're hoping for. Just trying to say, Mr. President, we need you to give us an advocate, give us people with expertise, person that basically has not only the ability, has the expertise, the clinical research ability, but also the passion to change, the culture of the FDA. That's all we're asking for. You're hearing from these experts, and Ed and I are so pleased with our states are represented so well. And our final, we saved our best for last, as always. We say that the females are always the best for last. Uh, Rhonda Eddy. Rhonda has been doing Yeoman's job for many, many, many years. She's the director of the Jefferson Day Report Center in Eastern Panhandle, West Virginia. It's been hit extremely hard because of close proximity to Washington and Baltimore, as you know, has been 
truly a center for this epidemic. So with that, I'll give you uh, Rhonda Eddy, who really knows it, knows it well. Rhonda. Thank you, Senators. My home county of Jefferson County is at the epicenter of the drug problem in West Virginia. It has the fifth highest overdose rate in the state. Drug abuse, like we've heard, is a chronic disease, and we need to start treating it as one. We need to continue to do what we can to help those suffering from the disease of addiction through evidence-based programs, services, and activities to reduce recidivism and create a, 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 a choice in incarceration. It's so important that our facility, along with law enforcement officers and drug task forces, have the resources to combat, combat the influx of drugs coming into our county. Last month, Jefferson County was one of 14 newly designated counties nationwide that will, re will receive HIDA funding. We're very pleased Senator Manchin worked with Director Botticelli and the leaders at ONDCP to ensure that Jefferson County and other high-risk communities in West Virginia get the help they need. This important designation will ensure that HIDA resources will be available for those who are on the front lines of the fight in Jefferson County. We believe that more needs to be done to properly address this crisis. We support the efforts of Senator Manchin and Markey to change the culture in the FDA so that we can stop these addictive prescription drugs from harming our communities. The health and safety of our families and communities in West Virginia and in Jefferson County depends on ending this drug epidemic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and they have questions? questions? Yeah. Um, Senator, You're talking about the 60 votes t today that's required to move on? Yes, 60 votes today and 51 votes. And 51 votes, votes tomorrow for confirmation. We're going to do everything humanly possible. We have a lot of senators, hopefully, that we can engage. Uh, as you all know, he came out with a voice vote, out of uh, a unanimous voice vote out of the health committee. I don't think enough of that was basically, or let this information we're giving, or for whatever reason, nobody on, on the committee has the passion that we have, or maybe their state's been affected like ours. But with that being said, We've been reaching out, Ed and I both been reaching out to our colleagues and we're hopefully that they will engage and understand and, and um, you know, if we're unsuccessful and that change and he gets, well, we're hoping that we've ri uh, raised this to a level high enough uh, that uh, the next administration is going to understand that there has to be a fight and a change to the top and culture must change within that industry. No, I agree with Joe. We're going to, we're going to do everything we <laughs> can. Give it we all can. we got. We're going to give it everything we've got. We just think that all issues go through three phases, political education, political activation, political implementation. There's just too much ignorance on this issue. It's, to a very large extent, the number one issue on the streets of America right now. When you're looking at a doubling and then a doubling again and then a doubling again of those who are dying from this uh, issue, um, this is the terrorist call that people are afraid of getting, top, that, an that another member of their family uh, has fallen victim to this opioid crisis. Uh, when it's when it's uh, when it's greater than all car deaths, when it's uh, greater than all gun deaths in the country, when you all could accidents. barely measure it just 20 years ago, um, this is very real for people, and uh, and and we feel that we have an obligation uh, to uh, to ensure that everyone hears this issue, regardless of what the final vote is. On Dr. Caleb. Let me just say this on what Ed said. If you have this, this spread of epidemic and people that are affected all over the country and it continues to multiply and multiply, would you not think the person in charge, the agency in charge of the drugs that are causing this, that they would say, oh, let's stop and take a look at this. Something's wrong. But yet they double down and we have more drugs being approved to come on the market than ever in the history of our country. Don't you think that basically before we continue to try to appease a business plan we should think about the public plan keeping them alive that's all we're asking for i know you have your hand oh, hi thank you uh, Donna um, i had a question on the fee that you had proposed 
you know, we're working on that. Let me just tell you how we've come about that. It's every time I go and we talk to all of them, we need help. And you know what? Uh, they don't, they'll tell you, we don't have enough treatment centers. People are begging for help, and it's, it, it's exa exhausting all of your resources, what you have. It's taxing every one of our local governments to what they can do because there's so much need. And I'm just thinking, I, I have a piece of legislation. I'm sure that Ed's going to be right there with me. He always has been on this. And we're going to look at this and say, okay, we're trying to put it so it really doesn't affect it doesn't affect the person that's in need. The person should be getting the treatments they need, that the pills would not be too expensive. But on a milligram of opiate, there should be some type of a fee that says this will be only dedicated and used for treatment centers. That's all. Now, I know a lot of people, oh, the new tax, new this, new that. My goodness, you know, you're hauling about everything else. We've got to find ways to save people's life. And unless you want to keep, keep building prisons, Unless you want all of your states and all of your communities, you're paying, you're paying jail, jail cell fill fees now. We pay jail fees. The highest fee that most all state and all county governments has is paying for incarceration because of drugs. So I'm saying, why shouldn't the person causing it pay something? Yes? So is that a tax on the pharma industry or on the people who are actually... Oh, they'll try to pass it on and say that, but basically it's going to come with a production, a manufacturer, farmers manufacturer of the... <coughs> Of, of these opiates we know they're addictive you know and the bottom line is we'd like to s make you think before you keep passing them out like candy I'm s yeah, you talked a little bit about trying to garner support can you say how many senators you got from either side those are going to join you now? Um, we're building um, and uh, and again it's it's not just towards this one moment it's towards this whole year. What is going to happen? We're deep into this uh, crisis. And as I said, whether we win or lose, uh, this is going to be a struggle that actually is going to go into the appropriations process, into uh, the authorization process, for bills that are going to be coming down the line. So Joe and I are saying, we're starting it right here. We're starting it right here, saying that the FDA has played a huge role in creating this epidemic and that every member of the Senate and every member of the House should understand it and that we're then going to take steps subsequent to that. So the total number of votes uh, right now we don't have a count but I will tell you this and this is how Joe and I feel that uh, we're now approaching losing a Vietnam's war worth of people every single year in our country. And the least that we want to be able to say is that we tried, we really tried to bring this to the attention of the Senate and the American people so that we started to take the actions necessary to reverse it. Let me just say this. There's not a senator that I've spoken to or Ed has spoken to that's not sympathetic and understands mm -hmm. the cause that we're on. If there's only two of us, if it's just Ed and I, it's a fight worth taking on to bring it to this level. There wasn't that much, that much discussion on Dr. Califf. We we've, we've, we've said this very Wow. This is a good man. This is not a person with some kind of uh, uh, resume that there should be a deal breaker on. Not at all. But just finally, should we not change a direction? And how do you change a direction when a person basically comes from an industry that's supported through clinical research? It's hard. Human nature doesn't ma let you make the changes to say, you've been my friend and you've supported me for 20 years. Guess what? No more. We've got enough. That's all we're saying. That's all we're saying. We're not saying anything against this gentleman's character. And with that being said, a lot of our senators have probably already agreed, and they've been had phone calls made to them. We just want them to think, think long and hard, that we've got to start changing, and the change starts now. I think I, their mission statement, we're going to try to change their mission statement. We have a piece of legislation, and I think we'll have a tremendous amount of support, bipartisan, that the mission statement should be the well-being and the public health. That's not their mission statement, doctor, and I think you heard Dr. Claudney speak about that. They don't think that they've done anything. They said, we did our job, they basically met this and this. And he said, if you look at basic historically where they're coming from, once they got hit hard on Zohydro, and once we start looking into Zohydro, how it came to market, unneeded, and they gave me the excuse because of liver damage and this and that, which a bunch of baloney as far as what we could see. 
they just were determined to bring this to market and they added insult to injury after we forced them to take all uh, opiates from a schedule three to schedule two that's when they said okay let's just double down now and they went against their 11 to 2 against the recommendation from that day forward he says we're not going to take this type of scrutiny anymore we're going to basically just bypass it and it's just callousness of what they're doing absolutely callous and i don't think the president knows i really don't I, if we do nothing more i hope that we basically have said mr president help us give us somebody that'll fight because we think he has fight left in him can i say this the original sin was 20 years ago yeah Purdue Pharma represented to the FDA that OxyContin was abuse deterrent. Well, OxyContin is oxycodone. As I said, it is nearly identical to heroin. OxyContin is shot for the phrase oxycodone continuously going into the blood system of the patient. That's what it means, OxyContin. Ultimately, it turned out that the FDA swallowed that representation, hook, line, and sinker, and it was completely and totally false. Ultimately, Purdue had to uh, pay huge fines for that misrepresentation. But that was the beginning. It's only 20 years old. And the culture at the FDA has continued as business as usual from that moment on. And what Joe and I are saying, what all of these people are saying, what people on the streets of the country are saying, is that enough is enough. This whole culture has to change. And that's what Joe and I are trying to do uh, on the Senate floor. It's to raise this issue so that the whole idea of abuse deterrent in OxyContin is put to rest once and for all. Yes, maybe it's more difficult to crush, but if you're taking these pills orally, the ones that are on the market right now, you're going to become an addict if you don't have the, per the, the, the proper understanding of how limited its use can be. And that will ultimately lead to the heroin overdose. Again, 80% of all people overdosing from heroin in the United States today started on these prescription drugs. And we don't think that it's fully understood and that the FDA is not responding to this cause. Yeah. Yes. If the FDA, sorry, I'm Shannon, I'm with Ned Page today. If the FDA were to make changes, if they were to make some concessions and allow uh, advisory committee meetings before every opioid drug uh, could be approved, would, would you? Well, we have, that's the legislation we have now. I have legislation basically that says that basically if the, if their advisory committee, everything must go before an advisory committee. You cannot bring an opiate to market unless it goes before an advisory committee. If the advisory committee recommends against approval, you cannot bring it to market unless you come to Congress. Explain to us why you want to put this new product on the market for our citizens all over this great country and tell me why it's needed. Tell me what we're lacking right now. We're the most addicted nation on earth. We're 5% of the population of the world, and we consume 80% of the opiates of the world. When you think back to 1980 and before for the first 200 years of this great country, you didn't have these dirt drugs, these legal, legal drugs. You always heard of some things on the market when you were in college and kids, and this, but you never had legal drugs back there that would do what these are doing. And all of a sudden, Purdue Pharma comes on, has the new wonder drugs going to cure all and take care of all the problems and it doubled down and created all the problems they're the same ones now saying go ahead and give it to 11 year olds we'll explain to them only in certain cases well you said you're going to do the same thing with oxycontin and look what happened there just go back and look at how much money they spent advertising promoting and look at the absolute amount of pills put on the market after that so we're not here defending a business plan and i'm not going to allow and stand as a u.s senator and allow a business plan to destroy the lives of West Virginians or Americans. And Can I just, and just answer your question specifically? The FDA approved Oxy for kids without an advisory panel. They approved Hyzinga without an advisory panel. They approved Tajinik without an advisory panel. When Dr. Califf came in to visit me in my office in November, I asked him point blank, would you have advisory committees for 
all future opioid approval. He did not give me an answer. I asked Sylvia Burwell, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, the same question. They said they needed time to deliberate. <laughs> that was in December. Then they announced just two weeks ago that they would not have advisory panels for the new opioids, which were in the pipeline at the FDA. So we have already received our answer as to whether or not the FDA is going to change its mind on whether or not there are advisory panels of experts like Dr. Kolodny who can raise the tough issues with the FDA and with the companies uh, on the impact that these drugs have upon the American people. Question, yes, sir. Uh, I would actually, I would have sent our mansion out. So okay, good. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I would ask you a Supreme Court question. Um, you've expressed your preference, uh, openness to have the president sure. nominate someone and go through the confirmation <coughs> proceedings. On the other side, a lot of Democrats are saying that if there aren't confirmation hearings that we should tie up the Senate floor, engage in those tactics, would you be concerned? I've been here for five years and we've been tied up. I don't want to be tied up no more. They know how I feel. You know what I've said? No vote and people take the safe, the safe path, all oh, these are tough votes, don't take them, I can assure you a no vote is worse, uh, is much worse than a tough vote. And with that being said, let the president do his job. He's given us caliph, uh, asked Mitch McConnell why all of a sudden caliph came to the floor and we're voting. And if you're thinking the Democrats, here we are, we, if, if we don't represent all sides and everything in between the Democratic Party, I don't know who does. So. With Ed and I standing here, we are opposing that respectfully. You can do that respectfully. And we're asking the president to engage and give us somebody. Give us somebody that has the advice, has the basically expertise, that's going to be an advocate for the people of America and keep these darn drugs off, these killer drugs. So I do recommend allow the president, he's going to make the nomination. We should accept that nomination. We should debate that nomination. And you know what? If we find that person to be unacceptable, like we find Caleb, we'll be up here speaking against that person too. Differ from the president on the issue of abortion specifically. Are you concerned that his nominee could tilt the court to the left further on? I, I think I, you know, there's there's going to be some even killed people. I think that basically, I truly would believe that he would pick somebody that's a centrist and basically follows the Constitution. Okay. Now you can look at that person's rulings in the back. I think of expertise. Don't give me a newbie. Give me somebody that's got you know has judicial experience and let us make a decision from there. But yes, I mean, you know, I mean, we look at all those things. I'm not a one-issue person, as you know. I'm going to look at the whole gambit of a person who can make a good decision that keeps the country strong and follows the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. The Constitution says that the president shall nominate a new time. candidate for the Supreme Court. Uh, there is no asterisk in the Constitution that says, except in the last year of a Democratic president. Uh, and that the Supreme Court should stay yeah. four to four for more than one year. Okay, so this is a huge issue. That's a huge issue uh, that ultimately is going to cause a lot of political um, friction on the floor of the Senate, but in our country as well, as well as in the presidential election. Yes, yes sir. You mentioned uh, working on this during the appropriation process, which the two of you support measures to withhold funding from FDA over this topic. If they're unwilling to accept the mission statement of changing their mission towards putting the public first, absolutely. We have to use every, I mean, if, if we don't believe that the Food and Drug Administration is responsible for the public well-being and they're going to ignore that and say that's not part of our mission and we, ex, you know, we as a Congress vote on that and they want to fight us, yeah. Tom Burton with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Senator Manchin mentioned the companion issue of, uh, of uh, Dr. Caleb's financial relationships with, with industry. And I'm wondering if either of you have found that that issue has resonated at all with any of your colleagues. No, I, I haven't found to where it's been, it's, it's to a level where there's a concern that he has done anything wrong. He has not. He even donated some of the money back. I knew all that. I mean, went through everything with him from that standpoint. But when you're in a culture that basically your program, your clinical research program, depends upon the funding that comes from pharma, when you look at a lot of the pharma companies that basically produce the opiates that he has to review, and now he's at the head, basically, and how this has been coming on fast tracking, I don't believe that we're going to see a slowdown of that whatsoever. 
or a repositioning of that. And with his relationship and association, it would be, it's just human nature, it'd be tough. That's all we're, that's all we're saying. Yes, sir. Um, two weeks ago, the Judiciary Committee advanced legislation that would address right. the opioid epidemic. Um, are you expecting that to come to the floor soon? And will you and your Democratic colleagues support it if it doesn't include the emergency supplemental funding? Uh, I think the Republican leadership is planning on meeting today and tomorrow to decide what the floor schedule for this week is going to be, so we don't know the answer to that at this point in time. Uh, obviously, um, we want to ensure that there is more funding. The President has called for $1.1 billion more dollars in treatment funding. These local communities are loaded with heroes, but heroes need help. It costs money to provide these beds, to provide the treatment, to provide the uh, education. So we're going to continue to raise that issue. Uh, Senator Shaheen is the leader on that, and we're going to continue to elevate it because the funding should be there. Part, yes, sir. You mentioned an amendment about prescriber education. Is that going to be on the mm -hmm. Uh, Senator Blumenthal um, was making the amendment in the Judiciary Committee. Um, he had an amendment that I had drafted with him, and they asked him to withhold that amendment uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, they completed the bill in the Judiciary Committee, but with a promise that they could then, that we could raise that issue on the uh, Senate floor. So that is our full intention. And, Senator Manchin and I and, uh, and others are all planning on working uh, together to advance that goal. The amendment uh, was there, and they just asked them to withhold. Yeah, we have quite a few of changing the, uh, basically changing the culture of the FDA. Should be a no-brainer, you would think. Uh, the Accountability for Public Safety Act uh, should be also one. As well. And Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. All of those, we're going to find out, but they've been, they've been very encouraging to accept uh, and work with these amendments, so we hope they will. Uh, yeah, on just. the changing culture of the FDA Act, do you think um, that that legislation was needed before FDA can begin to weigh things like you know, third-party risk or public health and opioid approvals, or do you think that that power already exists within FDA? I would have thought common sense would have told you that power already existed, but we found that common sense is not real common mm -hmm. in a lot of agencies. And we found out them to exercise less common sense than most agencies. Thank you all so much. Yeah. An hour and, uh, okay, an hour and on that uh, 10 minutes quit, quit on, that on an issue just tells you how important this is in terms Thank of the interest that the American understand. people have in it. Thank you all so, so much. Nice meeting you. Good luck with your program. Yep. Safe travel.